Hi, in the last decade or so, there's been an explosion of YouTube video essays. I was a little late to the party, but since watching ContraPoint's videos about four or five years ago, it's been one of my favorite things to watch on YouTube and just overall. I think I learned a lot from them, especially since due to the COVID pandemic, I started making my own videos. This is not the place to give a definition of this genre, but I guess that you could say that video essays use the format of YouTube video to present an argument on or explore an idea. The subject matter often has to do with popular culture, so video games, movies, but often it ranges through issues of politics, society, and psychology. Video essays, I think, are inherently pedagogical because in the process of performing the argument, the video essayist needs to explain, to teach the argument's building blocks. Some essays do so in an eminently accessible and entertaining manner. Therefore, I think that Anyone who wants to teach can draw inspiration and lessons from watching video essays. In this video, I want to suggest five such lessons. I'm sure you could learn this from other sources. Some you might be practicing already, but I hope that this spotlight might be useful nonetheless. Even if it's an encouragement to keep doing what you already do, it might be worth it. The point is not so much that you'll hear my five lessons and run to implement them in your next class or the next video, uh, the next educational video that you make, but that my video would encourage you to watch video essays. Well, I'm saying video a lot and therefore watch them with an eye and ear for pedagogical lessons, for pedagogical inspiration. I hope that after watching my video, you won't just notice what the essayists are saying, but also how they say it, how they present it, how they perform it. Let's get started. Lesson one, don't be afraid to go long. There is this prevalent idea around that attention spans are shortening. Everybody's on TikTok and Instagram, just scrolling, moving from one short thing, thing to the next. But learning takes a while and can be done in two-minute chunks. Sure, attention spans are short. I suspect they've always been short. But popular video essays can remind us that people, even students, can pay attention for long durations. Dan Olson at Folding Ideas has a two-and-a-half-hour video about why NFTs are bad, which has more than nine million views. Many of these viewers found it possible to pay attention for that long. Natalie Wynn ContraPoint has videos that are often more than an hour long and she has 1. million subscribers. She talks for an hour straight and people sign up. Tim Rogers at Action Button, where they make it a point to make very long videos, has a three and a half hour long video about the 90s computer game Doom and, and a six hour video about, to uh, I'm going to mispronounce this, Tukimeki Memorial, a Japanese video game. The latter has a million views. Did everyone who click on the six hour video watch all of it? Of course not, but some did. And sure, on YouTube, you can stop and start. I watched the NFT video in three or four goes at least, the Doom video in seven or eight probably. So I'm not saying give six hour lectures without a pause. Don't even lecture for an hour straight probably. Still, video essays can remind us that people, even young people, can sit and listen for a while. So if the material demands it, yes, you might be able to talk straight for 30 minutes and more. And especially if you are making an educational video, don't feel obliged to narrow yourself to into 10 minutes videos because of people's attention spans. Attention span widen if you make it worth their while. Lesson two, break it up. That said, a lot of talk without pause is hard to digest. One technique almost all video essays use is breaking up their videos argument into sections or chapters. 
Breaking up a lecture or video into sections helps viewers and students get a better sense of the structure of the material. The viewers can take a deep breath and batch together everything that was said before. If you lost the thread at some point, you can jump back in the, in the new section. New chapters give you a sense of progress and accomplishment. They're very useful. Now, I'm sure that many of my viewers now already think of their classes or videos as having distinct sections or parts. Maybe you include the part headings in your presentations. What video essays might encourage you to do is to emphasize the transition between sections. In video essays, you often have a significant pause at the end. You have a graphically attractive title for the new section. The, mu the music gets louder. Make uh, the section beginning an especially creative part of your presentation. Have it include an especially stunning image or dedicate a special font to section titles. Video essays often don't just call part two part two. They have a, a fun with the titles. In her video on cancel culture, Natalie Wynn contrapoints uh, split the video not into parts, but into cancel culture tropes. Each title then explained and, and exemplified in that section of the video. In the video Vaccine and Freedom by Abigail Thorne, a philosophy tube is uh, separated into doses instead of parts, giving a visceral feeling to something as trivial as breaking up the video into sections. Lesson three. Faces, bodies, and voices are interesting. I think there is a strong prejudice that in order for a class to be interesting, it must have a strong visual aspect. A lot of lecturers put a lot of effort into their presentations, adding graphics and images as much as possible as to make the lecture more stunning. I don't think that's inherently wrong, and some images, when relevant, are surely useful. However, I think that video essays, some of them at least, can remind us that lectures or educational videos can be visually interesting, not because of the presentation, but because looking at the speaker is interesting. I think that a lot of lecturers would rather not be looked at at all. But of course, as lecturers or teachers, we are looked at all the time. And we can remember that our bodies and faces like those of video essayists who often just film themselves talking, are interesting and do convey information. Bodies, faces can be a source of entertainment and information. Move from place to place if you are changing the subject. Show your hands if you are saying on the one hand and on the other hand. Roll your eyes if you are describing a point of view that you think is silly. Not all students will catch it, but some definitely will. And above all, don't feel like there needs to be a visually stunning slide connected to each and every point that you are making. Not all video essays show themselves, especially ones dealing with film or visual culture usually have images and videos running straight through and only offer a voiceover. Be Kind Rewind, a channel about classical Hollywood films, is a great exa example of this style. Still, the voiceover work uh, that these essays do can remind you that the human voice can be interesting and effective. Try to hear how these video essays use the voice to create a connection with the audience and show emotions. Maybe use those ideas in your own performance in class. Lesson four, make it personal. As educators or lecturers, we often want to put the material at the center, pretend some kind of lack of vested interest or subjectivity in what we teach. We don't want to talk about ourselves and our personal experience because students are here to learn, not, not to be our friends or, or our psychoanalysts. This is, of course, a good approach, but some emotional or personal involvement from the lecturer and teacher can give life and a sense of relevance. If the material makes you sad or makes you joyful, maybe it can make the students feel too. 
If the lecturer uses the material to think about events from their own life, maybe students can do so as well. Video essays, and this is where they are most similar to literary essays, often include some degree of the personal in their videos. This can be a show of emotional attachment to the subject. Look at H. Bomber guy. He's an expert at showing anger and exasperation at meager, the meager arguments presented by others. Sure, his style is over the top. He's known for violently breaking through plaster walls as he brings forward his argument. But many others also show and describe their emotions. Video essays often share personal stories as illustrations or even rationales for the videos. Natalie Wynn, ContraPoints, often does this, some would say overdoes this, in her video essays. In her video about the role of beauty in our society, Wynn, who is a trans woman, describes the plastic surgery she underwent to make her seem and feel more feminine. In her video about cancel culture, she uses her own experience of being canceled by trans activists on Twitter to dissect uh, the dynamics of contemporary internet culture. FD Signifier opens his video about how black men are objectified by American society. When he reads a DM he received earlier that week asking if he's circumcised. Now, I'm not saying that lecturers should always share personal details of their lives uh, with uh, students, uh, certainly not to the extent that uh, Wynn does it, nor should you probably show anger to the extent that H. Bomber guys does. But within reason and personal boundaries, these video essays can encourage and inspire us to bring more of ourselves to help connect with students and viewers. Lesson five, use characters and personas. I just said we can bring more of ourselves, but can we bring other people? One highly entertaining aspect of some, definitely not all video essays, is the use of characters and personas. Usually all characters are performed by the video essayist themselves, but so it feels like they represent some aspect of the essayist themselves. They are used to represent ideas and ideologies, but also personality traits. I'll give another example from ContraPoints because Win is really the best in the game. In her video about the left, uh, and why she thinks it is unsuccessful in garnering popular support, she introduces three characters. Fria, who represents extremist right-wing rhetoric. Tabby, who represents co convoluted left-wing ways of thinking and is also a cat girl. And Justine, a kind of left-leaning centrist who wishes to make left ideas more accessible. The Fria uh, character is mostly a caricature of ideas Wynn goes against, but is made more real for the audience because she is a visible person, not some abstraction. She's not saying, some people argue that, blah, blah, blah. She shows a character saying those ideas. Tabby is more complex. She's definitely a caricature of a certain kind of leftist, but she also feels like a side of Wynn herself. Now, obviously, most lecturers will not have elaborate costumes or develop characters to perform for their students. I'm not saying buy cat ears and wear them to class, though if you're going to do that, that's awesome. But even if you don't have costumes like Queen, you can still produce characters. For instance, I think that my partner, my wife, is a kind of character in my classroom. I tell stories about her and repeat her opinions so my students get a sense of who she is. You could do a slightly different voice when you are asking questions that challenge your uh, main argument. Maybe create this persona of a skeptic, sly lecturer uh, the, to accompany the more straightforward one that you present usually. So that's it for now. I hope we found this uh, list thought-provoking or inspiring. I'll put links to the channels I talked about in the description as well as some other video essays as channels worth watching. 
If you think I made something simple, just more complicated, that's fine. Sometimes that's my job too. Thank you for listening.